For anybody wanting to live that space trekking life, the trading loop is a great place to start in Starship. And conveniently, as of patch 319, trade is appropriately one of the game loops with the highest profit potential. So if making a fortune out on the space lane sounds good to you, then grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, then let's get into it. Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today we're going to be continuing with our guides looking at the world of trading. Trading Star Citizen is currently one of the best potential money makers in the verse. So for anybody looking to rack up credits to make in-game purchases of ships and equipments, it's a great profession to look at. One of the things that got me started making SC content was the idea that while you might have heard stories of people spending thousands of dollars, you don't need to spend anything more than $45 on a starter pack and practically everything else can be earned in-game. If you are thinking of jumping in, just make sure to use a referral code for a bit of extra starter cash. Mine's the one up on screen, but if you've got any mates who play already, please do use theirs. However, keep in mind that trade isn't just about reward, and we're going to be talking a lot about risk too in this video. While moving cargo from A to B might not seem like it's a PvP game loop, it most certainly is. Star Citizen is an open world game, and with physicalized cargo allowing pirates to loot your haul and various shady trade kiosks around Stanton willing to buy it off them, you are most definitely playing against other players when you get into this loop. Another key risk to acknowledge is that of this guide going out of date as commodity prices fluctuate, supply and demand change, and new ships are added to the game. And that's why the main purpose of this guide is going to be teaching you how to identify good trade routes and assess the risks of them as opposed to just telling you to go to one location, buy a certain commodity, and then head to another location to sell. This way, even if the exact examples I use in this vid go out of date, you'll be well equipped to suss out new opportunities. First up, let's talk a bit about what you need to get started in trade, and an obvious place to get going with this is with the ships. Essentially, any ship with a cargo grid can be used for trading, but there is a very large degree of variance in the size of these grids. So I generally classify ships into four categories. Micro covers your 6 to 12 SCU cargo bays found on ships like the Aegis Avenger Titan or the Origin 315P. Small covers everything from 20 to 100 SCU. So think of things like the Consolidated Outland Nomad, Drake Cutlass Black or Misc Freelancer. Medium for me runs from 100 to 300 SCU. This range includes some stalwarts like the Misc Freelancer Max, Crusader Mercury Star Runner, and the RSI Connie Taurus. And large haulers push beyond that 300 SCU mark. Here you'll find the currently largest freighters in the game, including the Crusader Hercules C2 and M2, and the Drake Caterpillar. As of the upcoming patch 320, we'll start to see the truly enormous class of space-only freighters in the form of the Misc Hull C but we'll just have to wait and see how that shakes up the world of trade when it appears. While any ship with a cargo grid can be used for trade, the question of whether you should use it is a different one altogether. Personally, I would say that trading legal goods in anything smaller than a medium-sized ship is pretty terribly inefficient. The profits you can expect to make scale with your cargo hold, and if you're shifting less than 100 SCU of most readily available commodities, then your credits per hour income rate is going to pale in comparison to many other things you could be doing with your time. That is not to say don't do it, but it is to set a realistic expectation. You can still have a really good time cruising around between different locations, buying and selling cargo, but you'll probably not get space rich doing it unless you do it at scale. The exception to this rule is found in illegal goods, which I classify as smuggling rather than trade. If you're currently rocking a small ship and looking to save up for a bigger hauler, then you might want to check out my smuggling guide to start with instead, which I'll link in the video description down below. The returns on offer from medium-sized haulers are okay compared with other professions, but it's the large haulers where you really get into the serious money making. 
But now though the C2 has the largest cargo hold in game at 696 SCU, and for the trading crown in Starset its only real competitor at the top of the food chain is the Caterpillar, which has 576 SCU. Both of these ships are available in game for around about the 5 million credit mark. The choice of C2 or Caterpillar is largely a personal one. I can completely hold my hands up and admit that from an aesthetics and an immersion perspective I do prefer the Caterpillar. It gives off total space trucker vibes for me. And with its many many landing gears it can be a lot easier to land smoothly. However just objectively from a min maxer's perspective the C2 is superior in nearly every way. Just for starters the 120 SEU difference is a 21% profit advantage. Then you also factor in the Hercules' far better handling and speed versus the Caterpillar. And if you're in this to make bank, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Plus as an added bonus, in the game right now the C2 actually has more utility than the Caterpillar given its ability to carry a huge host of ground vehicles. For most of this video I'm going to be using my C2 to show off what's possible at the top end of things, but we'll be able to take some of the data and extrapolate it to work out what we can expect from smaller vessels. While we're on the subject of ships, it's also worth having a wee chat about loadouts. At every step of this vid, I'm going to be doing my best to remind you about those other players, because it can be really easy to view trade as one of those chilled out, pop on an audiobook and sit back type game loops. Somewhat ironically, combat oriented loops like bounty hunting or bunkers are far less risky than trade. The worst that can happen is your ship gets blown up, or you yourself get shot. All you've lost then is a bit of time and maybe the cost of an expedited ship claim, but there aren't any actual punishments in game for death at the current time. But with trade you've got your investment on the line from the point you buy to the point that you sell. So before you invest in cargo, please invest in ship components. Upgrading your components to military grade A is pretty cheap compared with the value of a full cargo hold, and it will give you a bit of an advantage when it comes to HP and distortion shutdown time and that could make all the difference between a close call and a total loss. For trading builds, I also tend to swap my stock laser weaponry out for ballistics. In an ideal world, we're never going to fire these guns, so ammo count and sustain isn't really a concern like it is for bounty hunting. But if we do find ourselves in a fight, then the extra damage might make a difference, and there is a bit of a psychological impact where maybe a pirate might not be expecting a host of ballistics to be firing at them. And loadout doesn't stop at the ship, it applies to your character as well. I enjoy a good bit of piracy content, but the thing that breaks my heart is that nearly every time the pirates get on board the brick ship, the only thing waiting for them is someone in a white noob suit. Harsh truth time, if you're moving a million credits of cargo in a noob suit without a gun, I personally think you deserve to lose it. Armour and guns are really cheap, a good set of heavy armour and a weapon will set you back less than 20k. And if you're too much of a penny pincher to part with the cash, a single bunker mission will net you a couple of sets of armour and weapons for days. As well as weapons and armour, I'd bring the standards, med pens, a tractor beam and a backpack full of cruise lux to keep you going. In this vid I'm favouring medium armour, but let's be realistic, at this point aerial armour is mostly about branding. Medium is better than light, and light is better than nothing. And there is an argument that since you do a fair bit of running around during trade runs, that lighter armour with its enhanced mobility can be favourable. However, if you do get into a shootout with a boarding party, I can almost guarantee they're going to be in heavy, and if you're not, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. Bunkers are also a great place to find some loot-only weapons that can really help you tip the balance. Railguns, grenade launchers and LMGs like the FS9 can't be bought in the shops, but they are great things to carry. And finally, we have to think about our wallet, because if you've just paused the vid to run out to buy a ship, kit it out and treat yourself to some shiny new gear, and you've left yourself flat broke, then I've got a bit of bad news. As per the old adage, you've got to spend money to make money. Trading will require an investment to buy cargo at the point of origin, so you're going to need some seed cash to kick off your career. There are a variety of different commodities, so you don't necessarily need to break the bank immediately. But realistically you're going to want at least a few hundred thousand in your wallet at the start, probably rising to more than a mil if you're looking to get behind the sticks of a large hauler. As a general rule of thumb, avoid running the risk of leaving yourself bankrupt off the back of a single trade run. 
I'd advise only ever using half of your available balance to fill your cargo hold, leaving yourself a way to recover if you suffer a case of bad luck. Now that we've got ourselves prepared, it's time to take a look at planning a trade route. Thankfully, there are a few really useful third-party websites that provide a lot of detail and data that will take a lot of the guesswork out of this. And as long as you can get comfortable with the principles of trade and using these, you'll be fine even if the landscape has changed and some of the examples we look at go out of date. Two sites that I recommend and use most are SC Trade Tools and Galog. I'll drop links in the video description for both of those. And which one is your primary is really a matter of personal taste. Mine's SC Trade Tools. But one thing to keep in mind is that these tools are powered by contributions from the community, people going out there and submitting the raw data they get back. And while this is absolutely fantastic, it does mean that things can go awry from time to time. So it's good to have a secondary source, particularly if you see something that's maybe looking too good to be true. So for this example, from the homepage of SC Trade Tools, you want to hit Trade Routes. Then select your ship from the ship drop down. I'll go ahead and load up the C2. Then you're going to need to specify an initial investment amount. I've got a decent bit of cash in my wallet right now, so I'm going to set this to 2 million credits. Over on the left hand side, I'm going to open up the commodities drop down, and I'm going to tell the tool that I want to avoid vice commodities. Vice covers illegal goods like drugs. This is not me being the morality police. If I could be a regular Space Pablo and traffic in a C2 full of narcotics, I would, because the profits would be insane. But drugs don't suit bulk hauling for reasons that we'll come on to in a minute. With our selections made, we can just hit submit and get some possible trade routes. So our first contender is a gold run from Shubin Mining Facility SCD1 on Daymar, heading over to Area 18 on Art Corp to sell up. Even with my 2 million credits, I'd only be able to afford 356 SEU. But if I haul this amount, then I'd be clocking a profit of around about 688k. With a guided time of 18 minutes, this almost looks too good to be true. Because it is. So if I click on the Shubin facility here, then I'll be getting more detail about the outpost. Here's the line for gold, where we can see we've got a price of just over 5.6k per SEU. But then on the right of that, we've got details about the inventory. Every commodity has an inventory that determines the maximum amount that will build up at the outpost, and a refresh rate. This is the speed at which this stocks back up. So the gold at SCD1 will get as high as 500 SEU, not too bad, nearly a full C2. But when it starts to get drawn down, it'll only build back up at 10 SCU per minute. The inventories will refresh once per server tick, so that's roughly every 5-10 to 10 minutes, accumulating all those 1 minute increases. So given it's the top result on a site like SC Trade Tools, it's pretty safe to assume that the gold at SCD1 will almost permanently be sold out, or close to it. And you could sit around and wait for the ticks, gradually filling up your ship, but the more time you spend with your ship sat on the pads, the less time you're out there making space bucks and the more your risk of being caught by those pesky pirates increases. High value, high profit commodities like gold, and to a lesser extent things like laranite or diamonds, might be worth it for medium sized traders that could maybe fill up or close to in not too long. Or they could be worth it if there's also a plentiful supply of another lower value commodity to fill up on. But at SCD1 that's not really the case with fairly weak inventories across the board. It would be possible to create a list of these commodities and their buying locations and make a run between them to buy out the various inventories. But for me, carting around a ship nearly full of valuable cargo to try and finish topping it up is just adding risk on top of risk. Ideally, I want to find a spot to reliably fill up in one go and get going straight to the market. So I'm going to go ahead and add gold, laranite and diamond to the avoid list and resubmit. And then we get into firm favourite territory, the barrel run. Inventories at the first location, Art Corp Mining 141 on Daymar, are a bit weak at a max of 800 SCU, then a 6 per minute refresh. I can click on barrel itself here to bring up a list of all of the selling locations for it. And here we find a couple of standouts. HGMS Rider and HGMS Woodruff on Hurston's Moon Eater, have 30,000 SCU max inventories and a refresh at more than 300 SCU per minute. 
while Shubin Mining Facilities SMO10 and SMO22 on Microtech offer similar stats. With multiple bulk haulers able to fill up per servitic and sky-high max inventories that allow the outposts to fill to the brim in quieter times, there's very little chance of getting to one of these spots and being unable to load up. Over on the right hand side we've got details of locations where we can sell our haul. And these are primarily the Trade and Development Divisions, or TDDs, found at the four major landing zones. Hurston's Capital Lawville is a wee bit special in that they call it a central business district, but it's very much the same thing. A major stock market where you can sell a huge amount of goods to the planetary locations. And as you can see, there's some decent variance in terms of price. Horizon on Crusader, nowhere near a major source of beryl, will pay a good few hundred credits more per SCU than New Babbage where ready supplies can be found on the same planet. It's important to remember that the prices on SC trade tools aren't going to be up to the minute refreshed and completely accurate. But it is going to show you the trends, so here even a short hop is going to likely make a couple hundred thousand, but we can eke out more profit by going further. Before we move on from planning, it might also help to have a slightly less punchy route planned since I know, certainly to start with, that not everyone's going to have the 1.5 million to risk in a barrel run. So if I go back and knock our initial investment down to around 300k, we can just get some alternatives. And a really good one to highlight here is Titanium, where we can load up on a number of different locations around Stanton for about a quarter of a million. With profits at about 100k a run, this could be a brilliant entry point into bulk hauling. So I know we spent quite a bit of time on the preparation stages, but like I said, putting together these guides in this way, I really hope it just leaves you knowing how everything fits together, and that it will make you a stronger player overall. But it is finally time to take a look at some example runs. So first I want to look at a few different barrel runs to talk about the pros and cons of different approaches and how I might assess the risks of them. I made sure to start every run at a point of delivery, in effect a TDD, so that it simulates the whole thing, having just dropped off and then starting again. Then I'm timing myself start to finish and logging my buy and sell costs to work out some of the data. I've done each run a good few times just to make sure there wasn't a fluke and I can just average things out if necessary. First up, we've got the Microtech Shuffle. A very short haul route, buying Beryl at one of the Microtech outposts and selling it at New Babbage on the same planet. I'm kicking things off at the TDD, which is located in the commons area of Nubab, and a huge advantage here is that we can leave our ship parked on the ice outside the commons surface entrance, so with this run we avoid any kind of train ride, which can be a big time killer when it comes to trade runs that begin and end at a major LZ. For anyone interested, I'll be showing how to find this spot when we come back in. Once you're in your ship, make sure the course is locked in, we're heading to Shubin Mining Facility SMO10 on this run, then punch straight up to get yourself above the jump ceiling. If you want to really shave the seconds off your run, time is money after all, it pays to learn the jump ceilings for the planets and moons that you operate on. So here at Microtech it's around 11,000 meters. And as soon as you're through that, you can line up and calibrate the jump and hop around the planet. When coming into the outposts, be on the lookout for any chevrons indicating other ships. Don't be afraid to lock them with T and check your MFD to see what they're flying. This is a popular route, so it's hardly surprising to see another player here. But the fact that they're flying a C2 like us indicates they're not likely to be a threat. Be wary of people flying combat ships, and especially on the lookout for Cutlass Blues and RSI Mantises, which can dampen your quantum drive. These are pirates 99% of the time. At this point, there's nothing in the cargo hold. So if you see anything suspicious, just be a paranoid android and fly away. If you keep your destination set as you jump to your target, you can use the quantum travel mode on B to keep track of exactly where you're aiming for. It can be a bit easy to lose outposts, particularly on planetary surfaces like this. Land yourself at the outpost. You don't have to put down on the pad as the buying area is quite large, but pads can just make things a little bit easier given the flat surface. Hop your engines off with I before you hop out of the pilot seat, but don't power the ship down completely, since that would turn off your shields and you'd need to let them recharge again. Always take the way off your ship that leaves you the least open to someone sneaking aboard. So in the case of my C2, that's the elevator. If you've got an entrance which uses a ladder door, then definitely take that over opening your back ramp. 
then make sure you close up before heading into the building. You don't want to come back to find a dollar store pirate stood on your elevator demanding a takeoff fee. Outposts will have a variety of buildings, but these beacons help you identify important buildings from the air and the ground. There's an orange one outside any building with a trade kiosk in it, the blue ones mark Platinum Bay buildings where you can get small vehicles out. And inside we'll find the trade kiosk, so interact with this to bring it up. The light's a little bit awkward in all these buildings, so I'll just have to pull to the side a little bit. But down the right hand side is a list of all the commodities on offer and their current inventory. And as we can see, we're not going to have any issues filling up on barrel. From the drop down on the left hand side, we can select our ship, then click on the barrel, select this button on the right to max it out, and click buy to purchase a cargo full for 1.543 million credits. Click confirm. And maybe this is a bit of a superstition on my part prior, due to prior bad patches. But wait while it processes your order before pulling away from the terminal. Then head straight out to your ship. And just don't switch off. Look around for any would-be stowaways, hiding behind your landing gears. And be on the lookout for any ships that have arrived while you've been in the building. Once you're back to the pilot seat, engage the engines. And again, before you leave the armistice zone, just take advantage of your radar to check out for any extra chevrons. But if it's all clear, punch it. My shields are already maxed out, so it's all power to engines for quicker boost, allowing me to just get to that jump ceiling that much quicker. Get the QT drive spooling on your way up so that it's warmed up and ready to calibrate as soon as you can make that jump. A new Babbage has a unique advantage for traders, in the form of its surface entrance that gets you directly to the area with the TDD, skipping the train ride. So look for the spaceport, then follow the train line in until the point at which it splits. There's an area just here with a little inlet in the ice lake and a few domes, and this is where the commons entrance is. To avoid the fate of this C2 in front of us, I'm going to land on the ice lake itself rather than risking my haul by trying to get a smidge closer. Run up the hill and inside through the door on the left of the garage, and take the elevator back up to the commons, then follow the signs for the plaza where at the far end you'll find the TDD. At the trade terminals in the TDD, you'll be able to select your ship over on the left again, select barrel from the cargo, max it out with the button on the right and hit sell. Confirm this and you'll get paid 1.774 million credits. So this run took just 17 minutes start to finish and paid out a 231k profit. If I were to repeat this for a session, that works out to 815,000 credits per hour in my C2. That's enough to get my attention, extremely good returns and a short trip. What's not to like? Well, I like it. We passed someone else on the way in, so clearly other people like it. And of course, pirates like it. The buy locations on Microtech are amongst the biggest piracy hotspots in SC. Conditions are pretty much perfect. You're at your most vulnerable when making your way out of the armistice zone and up above the jump ceiling, and the climb out of Microtech is far higher than those found on moons, and the gravity of the planet will mean your speed is slower while you do it. Keep in mind that if you're flying this route solo, if you do get into trouble, your choices are to run or fight. Fighting ships designed for combat when you're in a hauler usually ends one way, badly for the person in the hauler. So running is usually the best option. If the people attacking you are slightly less competent pirates, there are a lot of people just giving it a go, and they haven't brought a QED ship preventing you from jumping, you might stand a good chance pushing for the jump ceiling and warping to any available marker. But assuming they're just a little bit smarter and did bring a Mantis or a Cutty Blue, run back to the armistice zone. Do not try to run out into space. Quite often pirates in this situation will be hoping that you will run to space since it will make your soft death ship easier to loot from. They'll just purposely not be bricking you in Atmo. Running back to the armistice zone will give you the better chance of survival in the majority of instances. One, you might surprise them and buy yourself a few seconds head start. And two, if you can make it, while you might be the proverbial seal on an ice floe being circled by killer whales, you will be safe for the time being, allowing you to call for help or negotiate passage. And I know that I might get some hate for suggesting negotiation, but let's just be practical about it. You're running 1.5 million credits of cargo solo, you're making 231k a trip, 
In this instance where you've been caught out to some extent but have managed to foil the initial attempt, splitting that profit with the people with guns to your head might be a smart move. Play your cards right and you might even get an escort for that run. However, the very best defense against pirates is to avoid the encounter entirely. So the next barrel run we're going to look at takes more of that approach. Because if the microtech shuffle is high risk because of pirates, they can't be everywhere at once. And you can head to somewhere that they're less likely to be. Just remember that you don't have to be faster than the lion chasing you, you just have to be faster than your friends. The Hurston shuffle is a very similar route, but this time we would head to Hurston's Moon Eater, where HDMS Woodruff and HDMS Rider have similar stocks to those found on Microtech, meaning we're not going to be hanging around waiting on server ticks still. The downside here is that we're going to have to eat landing at the spaceport and taking the train to the central business district to sell up. So this is going to add time to our run, but this negative is offset by a number of positives that make Eater a less attractive prospect for piracy. You're on a fairly low grav moon, so your ship is going to be handling a lot better than it was on Microtech. And the jump ceiling is far far lower at just a few thousand meters. This is not to say that you are at zero risk of piracy on this route, it's just that the window for a pirate hit is far far smaller than it is on Microtech. Pirates are essentially ambush predators. They don't want to scare you when you're still in the armistice zone, since that would give you the option to sit on your hands, go make a cup of tea and just wait them out but they need to spring the trap before you hit the jump ceiling. Since this window is smaller on Eater, it's a lot less appealing. Just keep in mind that since we've got to land at the spaceport this time around, you want to avoid storing your ship if you can. There's a random bug where ships can get destroyed rather than being transferred to storage, and the absolute last thing you want to do is blow up your stacked cargo hold, so just land in the hangar but head straight into the business district when you're on the return run. Doing a round trip from Lawville to Eater to Lawville was a bit longer than the Microtech shuffle, at just over 21 minutes. My purchase price at 1.629 million was also a bit higher, but so was my selling price of 1.892 million. So our profit for the run was also a bit higher at 263k. After factoring in the added time, the hourly run rate was a bit lower though at 751k an hour. But to me this 64k dip is worth it for the lowered risk. But what if we aim to play the market a bit more? So prior to 319, the prices to purchase goods had a fair degree of variance, but the prices offered by TDDs were much the same. But now there's quite a degree of variance in the TDD pricing. So I also did some runs of what I'm calling the Orison Arbitrage, buying barrel at my favoured locations on Eater and running them all the way to Crusader. This run obviously took a lot longer, since I'm facing some of the longest train journeys at Orison, and I've got a big old QT jump in the middle, which even with my TS2 drive does add a fair bit of time. However, the superior buying price offered by Orison helps cushion the blow. When you're doing these QT jumps, and indeed smaller ones like the one from Eater to Hurston in the Hurston Shuffle, take the time to add a dogleg. The Mantis has an interdiction feature that can pull ships out of Quantum, so you want to get off any obvious direct trade lanes if you can. Particularly in a run like this, where there is a potential for you to get snared in dead space outside of a comma ray. Simply don't jump direct. Set your first jump as you leave the buying location to a random Lagrange point. Travel for a little while, a million kilometers or so, then cut your drive by holding down B. Then from that point in dead space, realign to your target and continue your journey. This way you will have pulled yourself off the main route where a trap could be waiting. The Orison Arbitrage run took 32 minutes in total, but the improved offer of 1.956 million on an investment of 1.626 left me with a profit of just over 330k for one run. And that's meaningfully higher than either the Microtech Shuffle or the Hurston Shuffle. At an average of a tiny bit under two runs an hour, the hourly rate of 619k lags behind the others. I'm putting a lot less on the line to hit that number. So by now there's a chance that you might have guessed that in the real world I'm a finance guy. Before you ask, I'm too young to have been responsible for the GFC, I was still leeching off the state at university when that happened. But I just want to quantify some of this. So the margin on the Orison Arbitrage is 20.3%, versus 16.1% on the Hurston Shuffle, and a tiny bit shy of 15% on the Microtech Shuffle. 
The credits per hour is so much higher for Microtech because you can manage 3.5 runs an hour versus 1.9 to Orison. And that means that to achieve that 815k versus the 619k per hour, you're putting 5.4 million credits at risk per hour as opposed to 3 million on the Orison run. For anyone keeping score, the Hurston Shuffle involves 4.65 million credits an hour of risk. Now this is not me saying that one is better, they are just different levels of risk. And while the game might move on and new trade routes will open up with some of the examples closing, I'm hoping that seeing examples like this might help you just identify the risk as well as the reward of routes that you may consider in the future. Another example that might round some of this off is repeating the Hurston Shuffle, but this time with Titanium as opposed to Beryl. So I headed over to HDMS Bezdeck on Aerial, and as a bonus I was able to grab 34 SCU of Laronite for 83k, before topping off with Titanium at 362 credits per SCU or 239k. So my total load cost about 322k. I cashed this out for 432k, netting me a profit of 110 and the run was almost exactly the same length of time as the barrel run. So this will work out to about 314k an hour in a C2, but the amount of risk we're putting on the line is down a lot at 921k an hour. Keep in mind that if one run goes bad and you're left in the red, then you're going to be hauling just to get back to where you were before you lost a load. And at that point, profit margins really matter. So if I fluff up or get caught out on one of these titanium-centric runs, then I'm back in the black after just three successful runs. Whereas if I get caught on a Microtech shuffle with a hold for the barrel, it'll be seven repetitions before I break even from the loss. So it's really easy with guides like this to get sucked into trying to find the best run. But for three reasons, what I actually do is mix things up and visit different routes. Reason one is that it makes me much harder to predict. Pirates may well be camping a certain spot, but better drilled crews will be using scouts to scope out various well-known trading locations. If they see someone repetitively running the same route, they've got time to get the pack together and set up a hit. Number two is that running the same route over and over again will make you sloppy. It becomes easy to go on to human autopilot, and that makes you more likely to miss that chevron that wasn't there before. And reason three is a lot more about enjoying myself. I'll be honest, when I first started playing Star Sit, all I cared about was credits per hour. Not gonna lie, I'm still a filthy min-maxer, but maybe I've toned it down just a little bit. One of the coolest parts of space trucking is getting around seeing different planets, moons and locations. So by mixing things up, you don't just see the same sights over and over again. I can see a few comments coming in about maybe server instability being a bigger risk than pirates. But recently, 30k protection to save you from many massive server crashes has actually been working really well recently. I don't want to jinx it, but it has been. The big thing when it comes to if you get hit by a 30k while you're hauling cargo is not to go and instantly claim back the ship that you were just using. You want to wait, you want to make sure you give it a server tick. And then what should happen is the ship should become available at your home landing zone. So for me, I would have to travel back to Orison. I should then be able to pull that ship out rather than claiming it. And that ship should have all of the cargo intact. If it doesn't happen immediately, I would stress that it's better to just leave it, maybe go away and play something else, do another game loop and come back to it in some hours. Sometimes it can just be a bit slow to catch up, but that will save you throwing profits down the drain. So as I mentioned earlier in this video, the profitability of trading is really centered around the size of your cargo grid and how many boxes you can cram on board in a single run. This chart that I've put together is far from perfect. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to carry out timed runs in every possible ship, but I've just been backing out the results of my test run in the C2 to find a credits per hour per SCU figure. And then I was able to multiply that by the cargo grids of these various different ships. Key caveat, all of these ships fly and handle differently. So for example, while in these figures, the Freelancer Max marginally outperforms the MSR due to its six more SCU of cargo. In reality, I think the S MSR would outperform the Max due to superior speed and handling. But the broad picture is a fair representation. 
And it illustrates why I said you only really want to consider the trade game loop from a profit perspective once you're into the medium haulers and above, and capable of making at least 100k plus an hour. And realistically, if pure profit is your motive, it only makes sense versus other game loops once you're into the territory of the large haulers, at which point trade is into the most profitable loops in game. So we're nearly at the end of this guide, but I'd kick myself if I didn't point out one obvious thing. And that's that while everything until now has been about running solo, since that's the easiest way to just show the pure mechanics, you don't have to go alone. As per the well-worn drum I've been beating this entire episode, trade is a risky endeavour, and crewing up offers you the opportunity to reduce the risk by more than you reduce the profits. There's this typical trope amongst the more pew-pew minded players, that traders should just hire escorts. But we all know that people who are in the game for combat action have better places to be than on the wing of a cargo ship that might get hit. If your calling in SC is to blow stuff up, then there are plenty of loops in which you can do just that and make more than most cargo haulers would be willing to pay you for a ride along. And if you're after PvP, then there are options that will guarantee dogfights with other players, such as Arena Commander or, you know, SEAL clubbing at Port Olisar until someone comes along to push you off. So I'm not going to repeat that well-meaning but ultimately misguided advice. Instead, I advise you to form a trade consortium. Find another player or other players who actually want to do trading. Each fork out your percentage of the buy-in, split it in half if there are two of you or into thirds if there are three, and agree to share in the risk. Then at the other end, share in the payout in an equal manner. Sure you've decreased your profits per hour, but you've also dropped your credits risk per hour to the same degree, so your margins are effectively the same. Keep in mind that even a half a C2 would still be the fifth largest cargo ship in game currently. And once we get into the realm of things like the whole C next patch and we're talking about thousands of SCU, I think splitting the buy-in is going to pretty much become essential for most players. Importantly though, you've split your total risk by more than you've split your profits, since now you have turret gunners, making you a much, much spicier target. Keep in mind that you don't have to win a fight versus pirates, you just have to kill or scare off their QED ship, allowing you to make the jump. And should the worst happen, you'll have extra bodies with which to put up a fight for the ship. Just hold your partners to the same standards you roll with, heavy armour and a gun every time. Plus, despite all this talk of risk and return, spreadsheets, charts, credits per hour, etc. At the end of the day, a lot of space trucking is going from A to B, seeing the sights and getting space rich along the way. So having someone to hang out with and chat while you do that is no bad thing. If you happen to be waking away in the verse on your own and you'd like to get a taste of what the multiplayer aspect has to offer, then please do feel free to hop on over to our Discord. You'll find the link in the video description down below. And I think that's a great note to end this guide on. I hope you enjoyed it and that you found it useful. Please let me know down in the comments if you've got any additional tips and tricks. I know my guides are lengthy and detailed, but I try to make the guides that I'd personally enjoy. There's a lot of nuances in SC I think, and even in its current state there's little details and complexities that you pick up after a while playing, and I think for newer folks it does help to cover these when you can. If you think I deserve it, then consider hitting subscribe, and if you think it would benefit them, sharing the video with your friends, your org mates and your auntie who wants to get space rich does go a huge distance. It's crazy for me to think that this channel started just about two and a half years ago and we're approaching the 20k subscribers mark. So a huge thank you to everyone who's followed along so far. If you'd like to take your support a step further, I do have a Patreon and there are YouTube channel memberships as well. But honestly, just by sticking around and watching all the way to the end, you're already doing more than enough. So with all that said, thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.